we have everybody's here, so we should start, yeah? Yes, uh, of course. Okay. Nadila, we can turn off. Okay, the recording is on. All right. Excellencies, honorable ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, good evening. Uh, may peace and health be with you all. Happy International Women's Day to all women participating in this Zoom and viewing uh, live YouTube on tonight's program. Synergy Policies is pleased to welcome you to the platform for discussing current issues around us. We call it Speaking Up. We raise our voice, gather our mind and heart to the ongoing war in Ukraine. Tonight, we gather a very special panelist and participants from across Asia, especially ASEAN member states, to discuss ASEAN views on crisis in Ukraine, to identify the interest, the attention of ASEAN in responding to the crisis, and recommend actions to ASEAN as well as ASEAN member states. I'm Dina Praptoraharja, Associate Professor in International Relations, founder of Synergy Policies, and I will be your host tonight. I thank the support from all VIPs speaking tonight and the VIPs attending the event, also the presence of friends, colleagues, and media professionals. But before I invite Professor Makarim Bibisono, advisor to Synergy Policies, former ambassadors of Indonesia to the United Nations and professor of international relations at the Defense University in Indonesia. I'd like to draw your attention to the housekeeping issues and the rundown of the nice program. On the housekeeping issue, we provide virtual background in the chat room and Zoom participants, uh, you may download and apply if possible. We also provide link to input your attendance in the chat. F please fill it up for our administrative record. And we request that uh, throughout the program, you keep the mic mute until your turn is given. Allow us to mute as well if somehow your mic is open unintentionally to keep the forum conducive. During the Q&A, uh, you may raise your hand to get turned to speak well, your thoughts can also be uh, spoken through the chat box, write it down uh, so that the panelists can also read and consider. And for participants in YouTube, you may comment and my team should be able to catch your input as well. Uh, this is supposed to be uh, an informal dialogue. It's like a talk at the dinner table uh, among us, all the family of uh, Asia, Southeast Asia. So uh, on the round down, basically it's very simple. After the opening, uh, I'll say a few words to introduce the context of the panel and then invite each speaker to speak for about eight to 10 minutes. And then I'll follow up with some deepening questions to all panelists before we open the forum for dialogue. So everybody can raise their uh, issues, their ask points, and we, we shall respond uh, you know, uh, in a very dialogical way. Uh, um, manner. So without further ado, I'm now inviting Professor Makaran Mubisono to open this uh, program. Professor, the floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon you and happy Women Day. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Dina Praptora Harjo. Executive Director of Synergy Policies for organizing this webinar on the ASEAN response to the crisis in Ukraine. My appreciation also goes to the distinguished Mr. Mazuki Darosman from Indonesia, Dr. Sasa from Myanmar, Ms. Loretta and Rosales from Philippines, uh, Dato Said Hamid Albar from Malaysia, uh, and uh, Mr. Kobzak Sutiko from Thailand for their willingness to share their views toward enriching our understanding of the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. A sign of tension had previously been reported by the international media for some time. On Thursday of the 24th of February, 2022, Russia launched aerial maritime 
and land offices military missions. From the north, the Russian offices came from the border between Ukraine and Belarus. In the south, the maritime campaign penetrated the cities of Odessa and Mariupol from Crimea. Russian troops came from the eastern part in Luhang, Sumy, and Kharkiv. Three days earlier, the government of Russia formally recognized the independence of Luhang and Donetsk, two provinces in eastern uh, Ukraine with majority of Russian speakers. Separatist troops loyal to Moscow had occupied the two provinces. The genesis of the conflict began the demonstration of the Ukraine people who were against the decision of the then President Viktor Yanukovych in rejecting trade cooperation between Ukraine and the European Union. Later on, this grievance escalated into political movement to topple President Yanukovych from power. The fall of President Yanukovych changed the orientation of Ukraine foreign policy from Moscow to the European Union. This policy pivot disappointed Moscow. This disappointment seemed to have run deep as President Vladimir Putin is a demonstrate convinced of Ukraine long past as an integral part of Russia and has sought to simply reunite into one country as had historically been the case. President Putin publicly declared that Russia is seeking for the demilitarization of Ukraine. Ukraine membership in NATO is considered by President Putin as a threat to Russian national security. In his view, Ukraine should not be a member of NATO. Understandably, this could, in part, be attributed to the placement of missiles and troops facing east in most of the state that had joined NATO. The Russian perception of threat is further exacerbated through the process of the integration of the state of the former Soviet Union into NATO. In 2004, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Slovakia, and Slovenia joined NATO. Five years later, in 2009, Albania and Croatia joined. Eight years later, in 2017, Montenegro and Northern Macedonia joined. In 2021, the US even proposed in the NATO conference that Bosnia and Herzegovina, Georgia, as well as Ukraine be integrated into NATO. Geographically, Ukraine is located between the European Union and Russia. From a geopolitical standpoint, Ukraine's current challenging situation is in part due to the cataclysmic effect from being located between these two powerhouses. From a foreign policy perspective, however, Ukraine president faces somewhat a dilemma. A. On one hand, Ukraine is attracted by the economic development potential through NATO member countries. B, on the other hand, Ukraine is influenced by the advancement of Russia weapon system and high technology. C, in other words, Ukraine faces two choices in its foreign or policy orientation, a symmetric in nature, either toward NATO or Russia. On Saturday, February 26, 2022, the conflict was deliberated in the UN Security Council, which has the mandate to issue legally binding resolution on the issues of international peace and security. However, the US proposal to deploy the Russian attack was rejected by the Russian veto. The US then introduced debate on the issue of the Ukraine and Russian conflict into a special session of the United Nations General Assembly on the Ukraine conflict. Eventually, the resolution of the UN General Assembly was adopted. On the 26th of February 2022, ASEAN Foreign Minister declared a joint statement 
consisting of three points. One, ASEAN foreign minister were deeply concerned over the evolving situation in armed hostilities in Ukraine, calling on all relevant parties to A, exercise maximum restraint and make utmost effort to pursue dialogue through all channels, including diplomatic means to contain the situation, the escalate tension, and to seek peaceful resolution. B, in doing so, in accordance with international law, the principle of the United Nations Charter and Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia, ASEAN Foreign Minister believe that there is still room for a peaceful dialogue to prevent the situation from getting out of control. Three, for peace, security, and harmonious coexistence to prevail, parties must uphold the principle of mutual respect for the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and equal rights of all nations. Nonetheless, despite this joint statement, the reality is that ASEAN member countries have different outlook on the conflict. Singapore expressed its position to impose sanction to Russia. Myanmar junta was in favor of Russia. Vietnam calls for dialogue. Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines are in favor of the resolution. So it is indeed timely that today's discussion is entitled Speaking Up ASEAN Reaction to the Ukraine Crisis. We will listen to the view of Mr. Mazuki Darusman, the former uh, Attorney General of Indonesia, uh, Dr. Sasa, the, uh, from Myanmar, Ms. Loretta Ann Rosales from the Philippines, Dr. Uh, Said Hamid Alba, the Minister of uh, Malaysia, former Minister of Malaysia, and Mr. Kopchak Chutiku. Truly, a discussion with this distinguished group of speakers will shed light on the dynamic of ASEAN toward an ever changing situation in Eurasia. I wish you a successful and productive webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Makarim. Uh, okay, let's uh, start the dialogue. I will first uh, invite everyone to the table, to the center stage. I would like to, uh, my host to yeah, put everyone together, Mam Eta, Dr. Sasa, Pak Mazuki, and Kun Kopsak, Dr. Shet Hamid. Okay, we're all here <laughs> on the main table. Everybody's uh, listening. Um, basically, I thank you very much that Professor Makarim already um, highlighted the context of this issue that we are discussing tonight. And indeed, I think it's very uh, important for us to ask the questions, how do we as ASEAN member states um, contribute to de-escalating the conflict and making sure that uh, civilians are not experiencing worsened situation and become uh, victims of uh, major power conflicts. I think that's the critical issue here. So um, I would like to, um, before we start, we want to make sure everyone rest assured, we understand that um, there has been a lot of narratives out there discussing about Ukraine. Uh, it depends on which media you uh, read, you read and uh, or listen to if it's on YouTube. Uh, but one thing for sure, we know that nobody wants this war to go on and on. Um, and we know that uh, the diaspora of uh, ASEAN people uh, across the world has been affected as well by this uh, by this war. So let's uh, discuss further. Uh, I would welcome first to speak uh, Bapak Marzuki Darusman, advisor to Synergy Policies. Um, I don't think I need to mention all his uh, credential. His, uh, he was former, former Attorney General in Indonesia. Uh, and I think the most critical issue, he was also former chairperson of the Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on uh, Myanmar, as well as for 
UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in North Korea. And uh, he and I has been um, involved uh, watching closely this issue. And I would like to hear your thoughts, Pak Marzuki. Uh, silakan, Bapak. Thank you, uh, Professor Dina, and uh, thank you for the the uh, introductions. Uh, uh, in behalf of the of Synergy, of course, I join uh, uh, Pa Makarim and uh, Professor Dina in welcoming you and uh, thanking you for uh, being ready to take part in the discussions uh, this uh, this evening. Uh, thank you also to uh, Pa Makarim for preparing a quite an exhaustive uh, paper uh, as a backgrounder to our uh, discussions. I didn't uh, myself prepare any notes because uh, I thought we would be perhaps uh, much more engaged in in, in uh, discussing uh, directly with each other and. Uh, the sense, of course, is that anything noted down would have been uh, superseded by by events in 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 in, the, in Ukraine. But let me start with uh, with a uh, a baseline, if you will, that uh, as mentioned by Pan Makarim <clears throat> on the twenty fourth of February. <clears throat> now I'm using this uh, very careful worded. Uh, qualification, a forcible incursion took place in uh, Ukraine uh, by the Russian uh, military forces, uh, designated being involved in a special military operation in, uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, now, we are now 10 days uh, after that, uh, immediate uh, events, uh, events of astounding, astounding uh, dimensions. Uh, I would never have thought that that any one of us would be witness uh, to a to an act uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, an act of. Uh, violence undertaken by a member of the Security Council, the P5 member, in fact, uh, of a Security Council, the, 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 the main political institution of the UN that is tasked to oversee and to manage the um, uh, international uh, security. But be, be, it, be it as it may, uh, it has now uh, become a fait accompli, and uh, some would say that this is uh, an event of of uh, world order uh, scale in terms of its disruptiveness. It's uh, more than perhaps uh, a, a, a wake up call. It, it it might even be a game changer uh, from here on. Uh, now, you would think that uh, after the Bosnian War, uh, the region would have been exhausted in in uh, in its inclination there to to war making. Uh, an east-west standoff is now re-emerging, and of course that has impact on on uh, on our region. Now one asks, where did it go wrong? Now uh, we would perhaps uh, be able to look at the situation from a distance. But uh, now Professor Dina was saying that uh, this is a forum where uh, we are expected to uh, to speak up. Uh, I, I would expect also also that uh, being uh, a very limited. Uh, circle of uh, participants, that we this could also be a forum where we not only speak up, but also speak out our views, you know, uh, of what uh, we uh, think is uh, uh, going on there. Uh, 
as I was mentioning, uh, this might be just a distant uh, uh, problem for us. But we do have a little problem. And uh, my sense is that we should, at the same time, see how it impacts uh, worldwide. And uh, I think uh, at some stage, we inevitably, uh, we would have to draw our attention to what the impact of the Ukraine crisis is, would be on the, on the situation in Southeast Asia. And uh, clearly, I am referring to a, well, let's say a little problem in our region, uh, the, the Myanmar problematic. Uh, now, uh, ASEAN has uh, issued a statement, a, a statement that uh, is quite minimalist, minimalist uh, in terms of its uh, uh, content. Uh, I, I, we, we may be wondering the, the analytical underpinnings of that, uh, of that statement, which does not uh, come out quite visibly. Uh, we might also wonder uh, uh, what would be the strategic thinking that uh, lies behind that uh, statement, which again, uh, one finds uh, quite difficult to, uh, to pinpoint. It's a, it's a uh, uh, let us say, a, a vacuous statement, to be, to be clear. But then again, that is the way ASEAN operates. No, nevertheless, uh, that statement uh, certainly is a benchmark uh, because uh, it was intended to address that specific uh, point in time when the uh, crisis uh, started to, to emerge. And therefore, one would expect that perhaps uh, in the coming days, an updating process of, a, of, a, of an ASEAN stance or standpoint will then also emerge also after the uh, UN General Assembly resolution that came out with an overwhelming uh, uh, support from the uh, world community. Now, uh, aside from that, of course, uh, we note that uh, the junta in Myanmar also issued a statement, which is quite uh, interesting uh, and, and perhaps also no less uh, incredible. Uh, which consists of two points. One, uh, the statement that, uh, in effect, says, uh, as was stated by uh, the leader of the uh, junta, that uh, the Myanmar armed forces have now become one of the biggest and strongest in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN, thanks to Russia. Secondly, uh, it was further uh, stated that uh, Myanmar felt, or the junta, in fact, felt that the Russian action was wholly justified as a matter of Russia being a superpower. Now, uh, I would say that is quite an un-ASEAN uh, statement. Uh, we don't usually glorify superpowers <laughs> in this region. The whole point of ASEAN, in fact, is to manage superpower uh, external uh, dynamics. And uh, we have been able to, to, uh, to achieve that over the past 50 years. Earlier, uh, a, a quick chat with uh, Said, 50 years of peace in this, in this region. It is an, an astounding, uh, credible uh, achievement of, of ASEAN. Now, uh, what would be the consequence of uh, the crisis in, uh, in the Ukraine and, and drawing, uh, drawing a few uh, strands from that crisis and see how it impacts you know, on the region here? I uh, suggest that there are three issues that uh, might draw, attention, draw our attention. One is that uh, the relationship between the Myanmar junta and Russia uh, would 
as a consequence of the Ukraine uh, crisis, would embolden the junta uh, in its actions within Myanmar. It uh, feels that it's, it is now able to insert itself in between the, the, uh, the gap between an east-west uh, emerging standoff again, and therefore uh, envisaging itself playing a role in, in global politics, and therefore uh, uh, gaining confidence that uh, its position in uh, Myanmar has been reinforced, thereby drawing in further external forces into the conflict. So that's number one. Number two, the Myanmar or the junta position could affect a strain in intra-ASEAN relations uh, because of differing positions taken by ASEAN in, uh, the, uh, in the UN with regard to the resolution and, and therefore impact on the five-point consensus implementation. And all this leads to a third point, to my third point, in fact, that the situation in Myanmar will become even more protracted and uh, this has a way of uh, protracted conflicts have a way of eventually being pushed towards flawed solutions to the conflict. And this is, I think, uh, something that we need to be vigilant so that uh, from here on, uh, against the backdrop of a Ukraine crisis, that uh, all these factors being uh, in a uh, situation of interplay with each other does not aggravate the situation in Myanmar and would allow uh, a peace process to be put in place so that uh, we will soon see the resolution of the uh, situation in Myanmar. So I will end, I uh, will just uh, close uh, end there, uh, Professor Dina with uh, just the three points and then perhaps we could just uh, then uh, elaborate and uh, go into uh, further discussions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, it's it's uh, you you highlight a lot, uh, but a few things can be uh, mentioned here. You the scale of the issue, in your view, it's uh, not just a wake up call. <laughs> you say a game changer. It's a disruption uh, at the world scale, a uh, world order scale. I think uh, it's very important uh, to say that, that this is not just like any other conflict. And then um, you uh, raised the issue on the standing of uh, ASEAN together, uh, because in, uh, as, as we can see so far, there is no uh, common ground uh, among the ASEAN member states. And you highlighted a lot on the matter uh, happening in Myanmar and how it will affect the consensus that our leaders have made to solve um, the tensions, the conflict, uh, the war that's ongoing as well inside of uh, Myanmar. So uh, thank you for that. I'm sure everybody else, the panelists here, wish to respond to that. But I think it's very um, appropriate for me now to invite Dr. Sasa. Dr. Sasa is um, uh, from Myanmar the Minister of International Cooperation with the National Unity Government. Uh, Dr. Sasa, we'd like to hear your thoughts. Unmute, please unmute first. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much indeed for giving me this opportunity uh, to, to, to speak uh, today with you all. And I'm very, very thankful to all these distinguished members and guests and uh, all the organizers. I'm extremely thankful uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity. And firstly, I just like to make clear that the people of Myanmar and the National Unity Government of Myanmar reject totally this unacceptable, unprovoked, unprovoked injustify 
action of Fedor uh, Russian federations. And this is uh, the actions, is attack on international law, it's attack on UN charters, it's attack on a value, it's attack on basic principle of international norms and regulations. So we have made clear that the national unity government of Myanmar that represents the people of Myanmar will never accept evasion of Ukraine by Federal Federation of Russia. And it is also, we are very, very concerned indeed that this is triggering not just the, only the third world world. This is making the case of nuclear war that nobody like to see happen. If they break out, ASEAN will affect. We like it or not, we, our very existence is under threat. So ASEAN cannot keep silence. That is the point, the first point, we like to make it clear and loud. And it's also triggering global crisis. It's not just the fire that starts in Ukraine. If it does not become under control, we all have to be ready. The same fire will burn throughout our beautiful Asian continent. And the other point I want to make clear is that the response to Ukraine crisis by ASEAN has been very, very weak and unacceptable. As a human being, as a responsible human being, we have to take responsibility. ASEAN has to take responsibility. It's not about you know, other things. It's about taking responsibility when it comes into crisis. So you see the response of Ukraine crisis by the response by EU. It's the neighbor of EU. It's not even yet a member of EU. But we all watch the response of EU to Ukraine crisis. Look at they, they open their borders. They brought even the toys for the children to play when they reached the border. As 1.5 million Ukrainian people fled for their life to EU, they accept. Here, i like to point out, what about ASEAN response to Myanmar crisis? That is something that we have to look into our face. So, you know, let us, for the time being, forget about ASEAN response to Ukraine crisis. What about ASEAN response to Myanmar crisis, dear friends? <laughs> no, we have to learn the lessons from Euro, EU. EU response to Ukraine crisis has been really, really great so far. As we all watch, you know, even now we are, even our refugees, because of um, military coup in Myanmar, we have 1.2 million people of Myanmar fled, not just the last few days, but many of them have fled the last few years. Due to the crisis created by the military generals in Myanmar, and then uh, till today, many, many of them remained unrecognized as a refugee because our neighbor do not recognize our people as refugees. International cannot, community cannot even provide humanitarian assistance. So that is something that I think e ASEAN have to learn the lessons from EU when things happen like this. And also, 
international response to Ukraine crisis has been really well coordinated for the last 12 days. But again, international actions like sanctions on Russian Federation has been in many ways targeted, coordinated, and tough. Of course, more need to be done. But as you mentioned, Singapore also sanctioning Russian Federation for their actions on Ukraine. The same. Why Ashad is not taking any sanctions towards the military junta in Myanmar? To me, it's a hypocritic. To me, it's just unacceptable. Now we see the real picture of ASEAN in actions to its it neighbor where it come to a crisis in Ukraine. So it's really happening now is the Ukraine crisis versus Myanmar crisis. And international community are pouring out their healthy hands into Ukraine, not just only humanitarian assistance, but also to lethal weapons assistance. And the people of Myanmar are being slaughtered in cold blood by their own military that swear to protect them. And now, as we speak, the people of Myanmar, nearly 2,000 men and women, children have been killed since last year, 1st of February. So, why international community are responding to Ukraine crisis in such speed, such momentum, but why international community are not taking the actions towards Ming outline? So it's about Ming outline versus their side Vladimir Putin, their side the people of Myanmar and Ukraine people of Ukraine. We are suffering the same thing. But we are being treated, treated not the way how Ukrainian people are being treated by international community. I think that's that's the response of ASEAN has to be clear and loud that ASEAN should be paved the way to solve the crisis in Myanmar. And now you see even justice and accountability like ICRC, international criminal courts are now trying to open the office in Ukraine to investigate possible crime against humanity. But look at the Myanmar. It has been to our Rohingya brothers and sisters. More than 25,000 Rohingya people are being killed just like that. It's genocidal attack to humanity. But, you know, the same justice accountability, you know, that does not take place. So ASEAN should speak it up. It's a very, very important. And ICJ and ICC, International Mechanism for Justice, has to be also in action in Myanmar. As it's in Ukraine, in fact, Ukraine crisis has been just 12 days. But Myanmar crisis has been for years there. But there's no such kind of justice accountability. Who will talk about that? It should be ASEAN that should be taking the leadership to bring that kind of justice and accountability. Justice and accountability in our neighbor also will mean justice and accountability in Ukraine. And the other point, and the last final two points I'd like to make is, it's about Ming Aulai versus Putin. And it's that the people of Myanmar versus Ming Aulai military dictators. The same, it is the Ukraine people versus Vladimir Putin, authoritarianism, a dictatorship. And it's about the principle, it's about the value, it is about democracy that we all hold dear. It is about humanity, it is about humanitarian, it is about treating another human being as the way we would like to treat us. It is about the lights against darknesses. Dear friends, it's about tyranny versus freedom. It's about dictatorships versus democracy. 
It is about authoritarianism between elected leaders. It is justice between justice and injustice. It's a very simple. It is between good and bad. It is really simple between Zelensky, President Zelensky of Ukraine, who are elected by the people of Myanmar. And at that side, authoritarianism, Mr. Putin, is very simple. It's about the people of Myanmar against military dictatorship led by Ming Aung. It's very simple. It's about the freedom of the people of Myanmar and the freedom of the, the people of Ukraine versus authoritarianism dictators like Vladimir Putin and General Ming Aung of Myanmar. So, dear friends, when we speak out, it's very important that ASEAN also take actions. We need to help our, our, the people in Ukraine. We need to help the people in Myanmar. At least we need to show that we are human beings. We need to show that we are in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. When the freedom is being attacked in one part of the country or the globe, our very freedom at home is under also attack. When the value of human being in Ukraine is under attack, the value of human being in the whole Asian continent is being also under attack. When the sovereignty of other country is being attacked, the sovereignty of our own country is not safe. When territory integrity is being under attack by other country, the same, it's being also under attack in our home. So it is about attack on our freedom, attack on our democracy, attack on our value, attack on our integrity, attack on our sovereignty. We all need to recognize that is happening if we do not prevent this in Ukraine and in Myanmar, remember, let us not forget, it is also coming to our own home. Let us prevent before it's too late by taking actions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sasa, uh, for bringing in another dimension of uh, the Ukraine crisis, uh, which is actually very near to our neck of the wood. It's our own neighborhood. Uh, Myanmar is nearby and you draw um, the line there to see the, solid, the needs for solidarity, uh, for humanities, the need to speak up for democracy, the need to uh, go, uh, go strong yeah, on making sure that if we are uh, concerned about what's going on in Ukraine, we should also be concerned about what's going on in Myanmar. Well, thank you for putting that on the table. I would like now to invite my uh, my sister uh, in the Philippines, <laughs> who has been very inspiring, Ma'am uh, Loretta and Rosales, former member of uh, Parliament in the Philippines, former head of Philippines National Human Rights Commission. You have seen a lot going on, not only in Philippines but also across ASEAN. What do you wish to say uh, for this forum, ma'am? <clears throat> okay. Um, I found the statement of the Philippines in the emergency special session of the UN. So let me read it. But while I read it, I shall be giving my own analysis. Okay. And then I'll also read a statement of Sambayan. Sambayan is a very new coalition <clears throat> that was set up for the coming elections, we're all be very busy because we're gonna have elections by May 9, 2022. And um, the president of the Republic of the Philippines has been a very interesting and controversial figure so that um, we feel that it's going to be a milestone if we are able to push these elections. And uh, Sambayan, I'm going to read Sambayan's statement, but at the same time, I'm a member of a party list, the political party, Akbayan, which shares the same interests. So my analysis will be that of Akbayan and also Sambayan. 
let me start first with the Philippine statement, which caught us by surprise, by the way, at the emergency special session of the UN General Assembly on Ukraine. This was done 28 February 2022. So that's about four days after the baseline actual invasion of Ukraine. So uh, he goes this way, Mr. President, this is a Philippine statement from the Department of Foreign Affairs. Mr. President, the Philippines votes yes to the UNGA resolution and expresses explicit condemnation of the invasion of Ukraine. No one can trust news reports of casualties on either side, but 14,000 have been killed since 2014. In the current fog of lies, we have yet to determine the true casualties on both sides. We appeal for the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructures. We strongly urge the cessation of hostilities, but while an offense can be stopped at will, the defense cannot rest until the offense stops. And we know this for a fact. We all know we, how the civilian infrastructures have been bombed, the um, buildings, the homes of the civilians have been bombed. And of course, as pointed out, uh, the nuclear power plant is now in the control of the Russians. We call for massive assistance commensurate with a growing humanitarian crisis and echo the United Nations Secretary General's appeal for respect of humanitarian principles to protect civilians and civilian infrastructures in Ukraine. Safe access to humanitarian assistance must be assured by the most effective means. The principle of sovereignty and the sovereign equal equality of states is enshrined in the United Nations Charter. <clears throat> all states enjoy the right to full sovereignty in all the areas of jurisdiction. The Charter of the United Nations requires sovereign states to refrain from the use of force against the political independence and territorial uh, integrity of states. We especially condemn the use of separatism and cessation, which was mentioned a while ago. I think those two provinces as a weapon of diplomacy for inviting and inflicting terrible cruelties and indiscriminate killings far in excess of that of any other kind of conflict. We saw this in the Balkans and in Africa. We strongly urge resort to the 1982 Manila Declaration on the peaceful settlement of international disputes. It will at least halt the ongoing tragedy for a while. You know, when it happened, as it happened, I felt, because there's been a lot of analysis about you know, Russia being scared since it's being encircled by NATO and all these post-satellite <coughs> that were post-satellite states of the USSR have actually been joining NATO as has been brought out by the introduction of uh, Professor, I forget his name. <clears throat> but anyway, as, while that is true, it is also a fundamental principle that the right to self-determination is a fundamental right in the constitution, in our constitutions, in the UN Charter, and likewise in the UDHR and its core of human rights, international human rights instruments. I was thinking to myself, why should Russia claim this post-satellite states of the USSR when it was dissolved in 1991, when in fact it was the choice of these states to get out of the USSR. That is a matter of self-determination. But to claim now that they are not independent, that they still belong because 
you know, Russia has continued with its relations with all these states is to me hogwash. It's hogwash. And I don't think that, I mean, the claim of uh, the Soviet Russia of Putin trying to get back to all these states and hopefully trying to get them one by one to be able to form and recover, recover them and form something similar to Soviet Russia as it was pre-1989 is to me, you know, um, something that goes against the fundamental principles of the UN Charter. It is a fact that, and um, in the subsequent statement that we had in the Sambayan, Sambayan is the coalition that is now in, uh, engaged in the, the United, in the Philippine elections this coming uh, May 9, and I happen to be a convener there at the same time that I happen to be in, in my political party, in the party list system. But in the Sambayan statement that we had, it was very clear to us that the right to self-determination is a fundamental right and cannot be questioned. I don't, when, when Ukraine got out, it had its own sovereignty, it had its own um, feelings, a sense of being independent, and therefore it has to be respected. But it is not being respected. And Russia feels that they just have to take over Ukraine for economic purposes, for security purposes, and for political purposes. In any event, in the other statement that we had, <clears throat> we say that we join the rest of the world, strong condemnation of Russian invasion and demands immediate withdrawal. The bedrock principle rests on Article 2 of the UN Charter, Paragraph 3 and 4 of the 1945 UN Charter. All members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such a manner that peace and security and justice are not endangered. All members shall refrain from using threats and the use of force against the territorial integrity and political independence of nations. Thus, states must settle their disputes through peaceful means in accordance with Article 33 of the UN Charter. This fundamental principle has prevented a world war since 1945. It has restricted powerful states from trampling on lesser states, has outlawed war as a legitimate means in annexing territories, has changed the age-old principle that might makes right into right makes might. Russia's barefaced lie that Russia signed the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, I think is important because along with the US, the UK and Ukraine, all states would guarantee the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine in exchange for the stockpile of nuclear weapons inherited by Ukraine from the USSR. But Russia has violated this blatantly. <clears throat> we cannot allow Russia to resurrect and solidify by state practice the UN Charter and the world has expressly rejected. The success of invasion will embolden China. Very similarly, as Dr. Sasa has said, will embolden um, the military of uh, Myanmar. But in our case, it will embolden China and other autocratic states to do likewise. The Philippines is not only a founding member of the United Nations Charter and a proponent of the Manila Declaration, but has enshrined renouncing war as a matter of solving disputes in its constitution between and among states. So Dina, uh, to, make it, to, to make a last uh, position, I sympathize with Dr. Sasa when he talks about Myanmar, because I teach migration and we always discuss the Rohingyas. We always discuss 
the problems of Myanmar, and I myself have had personal experiences in putting together the NHRI, the National Human Rights Human Association Rights. of, uh, of uh, Myanmar. So it, it is really with such disappointment that the military has taken over and has now been emboldened and is now, I think, being emboldened further to do what uh, Russia, to do what it has been doing precisely because Russia has shown its example. In our case, it is China and China's intrusions into the world, into the West Philippine Sea and Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia and uh, Borneo have similar concerns within the South China Sea. So I feel that in our case, maybe this is a time where ASEAN states should come together uh, and you know, find out where we have our EEZs and protect our EEZs against the intrusions of China. Because China, in our case, has actually intruded into the West Philippine Sea, into our waters, and has threatened three points. Three points as a major point. One is the food security that goes around the West Philippine Sea. We are now importing fish that belongs to us in the West Philippine Sea from China because they have fished, you know, they have used bigger, much bigger vessels to fish from the West Philippine, Philippine Sea. Number two, it also has destroyed the coral reefs in the West Philippine Sea. And number three, it has actually threatened our sovereignty and our dignity as a nation. So it is in this regard where I would feel that, like you know, pointed out by Marsuki and by Dr. Sasa, ASEAN should be stronger, should solidify, should look into their common interests, and that way they can face big powers without being so frightened. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Eta. Uh, very uh, interesting uh, angle that you take. Uh, I think you um, also embolden the statements from Dr. Sasa and as much as possible also uh, highlight the importance of what Pak Marzuki has mentioned earlier, that uh, when we allow um, territorial integrity being attacked, sovereignty being attacked, and um, autocratic uh, countries, uh, you know, doing whatever they want, uh, even if it's far away, not uh, not in our part of the uh, of the region, it will definitely affect us. And indeed, there has been occasions where it actually happened, but but we still consider that as something that's not very urgent, apparently, in ASEAN to to put out uh, stronger statements against these uh, powers. So thank you for putting that on the table. Now I would like to invite uh, my uh, special guest from Malaysia, uh, Tan Sri Dato Siri, Dr. Shet Hamid Albar. Um, you have been very experienced in a lot of ministries in <laughs> Malaysia, was former Minister of Justice, Minister of Defense, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister of Home Affairs in Malaysia. And I'm sure you're very well uh, connected uh, across the region because you're also a member of parliament. So we'd like to hear uh, how you see this uh, ongoing happening uh, in Ukraine as well as in our neighborhood. Ansri, the floor is yours. Please uh, open the microphone, please. Sorry, I ah. think so unmute. I was talking to myself. <laughs> I've been listening for so long. Uh, thank you, Dina, for including me to be a panel member with this very uh, esteemed uh, panelist. Uh, I'm very happy to see my friend, uh, Professor Makarim and pa Mazuki and Kopsak and the rest of the members of the, of the panel. 
I think it has been very interesting. We have got an overview from Professor Makare, and then we have got a very good uh, analysis of what we could do. I thought, uh, you know, I'll try to chat through because your intention was to have a chat. And I thought that my dinner will not be wasted if, <laughs> if I were to read my statement. But uh, just like others, I just would like to make Malaysia's position known. You know, uh, uh, if not for Loretta just now, I wouldn't have bothered to talk about Malaysia's statement because I think all our statement is known or uh, any. I think Malaysia's statement, this is a typical ASEAN statement. And I think we should not blame each other's country. There is a, there is a different cultural difference between ASEAN and other regions. I think this first must be recognized. It has to be recognized, you know, step by step, you know, cautious, careful not to hurt, face saving, you know, all these things I talk through because it is, uh, that's how. Malaysia, we say that. You know, we agree, our, our statement is that we agree and supported the resolution, though not in every single word. Uh, but I think the principle of all of us, there is consensus, there is commonality, I think, internationally, among the international community. Our reason for supporting the resolution is to uphold the principles of sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of states. I think that's period. Everyone understand that. But no, uh, I think here, what are we going to contribute as ASEAN? In the first place, ASEAN reaction, if you look at ASEAN re reaction, Ukraine is not even known or very popular in our part of the world. We may know Russia because it is a big power. It's a great power. But Ukraine was, was something else. So uh, is, is, uh, when the whole issue of Ukraine I think our reaction has been uh, that's far away from us. It's not, you know, it's not going to affect our region. Obviously, in our discussion, though I agree and subscribe to many of the statement of the uh, statements made by our by my preceding colleagues, but I think uh, we have to look at the complexity of the issue. It is in this particular case, ASEAN, in the first place has to look at itself in terms of conflict resolution, in terms of settlement. I think, you know, what I'm, I, I'm surprised is that when you, you know, now if you read the uh, media, the Western media say there is only one party wrong. In a conflict, there's no such thing as one party wrong. That's my view. You must look at both sides in order for you to find a solution. But if you are going to encourage conflict to go on, if you are going to encourage this di the dynamics between uh, the Russian Ukraine crisis, and maybe in our region, is this one will break a third world war, nuclear war. It's, it's not as, as simple as, you know, as uh, straightforward. It, it, this is a very, very uh, worrying thing. And as, ASEAN, I think, uh, here, ASEAN with its track record should come out very strongly. I agree with Dr. Sasa, I agree with Loretta, I agree, uh, to show that we can, we have credibility to speak on how to maintain peace. If you remember the, our founding fathers, when we formed ASEAN, the intention of forming ASEAN was to make sure that our region does not become a platform for great powers rivalry. That's the very core fundamental issue. And I think definitely in this one, we do not want to take sides, but at the same time, we want to stand by international law. We want to stand by international law, international uh, norms. We want to stand by the UN Charter. But remember, don't, don't forget, uh, I think in this particular case, if you're going to be a teacher, you must, a preacher, you must also be a practitioner. Don't forget about the right of, you know, uh, the fear for exist, existing, you know, the, the fear for threat. Is it real or not real? What's the necessity of one group being formed when the world is so peaceful? We do not want to see the world, you know, at, at odds with each other, in conflict with each other. 
And then I think Gorbachev for his trade off of Warsaw Pact, dismantle the Warsaw Pact so that uh, NATO would also uh, not expand to the, uh, to the east, closer to the Russian border. You remember the case of, uh, I think, if we look at the United Nations history, international politics is not like our domestic politics. Mine is not right. But in international politics so far, my experience is that uh, might has always been right. <laughs> so it's a different dimension entirely. The domain is different. ASEAN, unfortunately, in this particular case, we are not fully united. And uh, our statement and vote during the General Assembly, you know, two of our, you know, Vietnam and Laos abstain for very good reason. And then I think, uh, and then uh, you see uh, Timor Leste, uh, followed with the uh, other ASEAN, eight ASEAN members for agreeing to the resolution. But I think in this particular case, the resolution is a good start, but the solution is not in the resolution. The resolution, it cannot be asserting right and wrong, but finding what is the solution to the whole problem. For, to see that there is still an opportunity and a chance for us to find a diplomatic solution to this. We do not find diplomatic solution. I, I, as I mentioned, ASEAN now, uh, Dr. Sasa, going through to our vision 2025, I think 2025, we have formed high level task force in order to look at it. If we can't even agree on the security as you described in Myanmar, we can't even find solution to the five point consensus. You know, I mean, you you can't preach about to other people when even the five point consensus we we are not moving anywhere. So it's a bit difficult. But at the same time, I think uh, I I would like to to look at it that there is still an opportunity. You, you but you know you you must not blame this is Russia's fault. Gorbachev trade off. Our friend uh, Putin. To some of us, we don't like the word our friend, but I consider every member of the you know, leaders of the international community our friends, even though they are maybe forced to us. You know, our friend say that he has no intention of occupying Ukraine. He has no intention of invading Ukraine. But how, would, how do you look at this situation and the situation in Cuba? I mean, don't, don't forget the Cuba situation. What broke? The thing in Cuba situation is diplomacy. Is the diplomacy of both sides coming to talk to say, yes, I feel threatened because it's so close. Russia does not want to expand its state to include more states to become, you know? but what is the necessity of the existence of NATO when there is no more war? So I, I was reading in uh, many articles about the problem with big power rivalry and competition. Big power rivalry and competition, which is happening in this present case, the result, the outcome of big power rivalry has always been war. In the great majority, it's been war. Can you tell me that the, uh, the, uh, the bombing of, say, Iraq, say, for example, is it a right of self-defense? Is there a United Nations Security Council uh, resolution approving it? I think this is the thing where ASEAN has to play a role that we are the great advisor of governance and rule of law. We believe in international law and uh, we are not a small player because mind you, because we are disunited, people look at us unimportant. But if you look at ourselves, we are almost 600 million. Yeah. So we need to be coherent and cohesive I think in it, and uh, I think if uh, I think Putin, uh, according to I was looking, uh, I was reading at Kissinger, you know, because we tend to blame. Uh, in it. You look at Meshaimer, say Professor Meshaimer, an international, you know, political scientist. He says that it is wrong for NATO and in, to push and provoke. He says that to provoke Russia. And there is, uh, Ukraine should be neutral. And now I think even Kishinga have said that Ukraine should not be either east or west. It should be a bridge to bring both sides together. 
And I think this is a thing that ASEAN can play a role. But what I'm worried is the point mentioned by uh, Marzuki, Pak Marzuki just now. What I'm worried is what is the signal that Myanmar is sending when he says, uh, he says, the leader of the junta says that Myanmar has got the biggest army in ASEAN. What is the message? If ASEAN does not react to this peace and security threat, then there must be something with, uh, wrong with us. And then the other part of it, we should be a party encouraging. We have got a lot of problems within our region. Russia, not to be the biggest arms supplier yeah. to a country that is not respecting human rights. I'm, you know, I'm very concerned about question of humanitarian law, question of human rights violation, I think which Pak Marzuki is very familiar with. And, you know, but what this crisis has shown me is that the dynamics of double standards mm. and selectivity which is not good for the world. We are using different standards. That's why Dr. Sasa is frustrated. Why different standard for this? Why different standard for that? I think why don't ASEAN decide, decide its own destiny? What we must, first of all, believe in one standard. Believe in doing something based on international law, based on human rights, respect for it, the Rohingyas, you know, when the Rohingyas, nobody cares about the Rohingyas, refugees. Let me tell you, all of us, I, I think I, I salute the European Union for the opening, you know, they responded with an outpouring of public and political support for the refugees. That is fantastic. ASEAN should learn. ASEAN should not be closing its doors when there are refugee problems. We are so jealous of guarding our borders. And these are refugees. But the thing that is very clear in the whole crisis that ASEAN should take note and should never learn the lesson from on the refugees is that there is an element of racism, xenophobia, and neo-Nazi uh, uh, action in some of the countries. And some of the statements made is quite scary. And I think that the president of South Africa has objected to the European Union the way. And if you look at NBC and CNBC, you say, oh, these people are blue eyed like us. They are white -eyed like us. They are civilized, not in a third world country. But I like to remind this channel, remember that all the peace in this world is in our part of the world, not in Europe. All the killings, the Holocaust, that's not happen in Asia, in Asia, on Asia and on Asia. But in that, you know, the civilized people are the ones that cause all the conflict and the problems. So there is much that we can teach them. So I would like to teach. I think, sorry, Dana, for <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking aloud. I'm speaking my heart. I'm speaking humanity. I'm not trying to hide how I feel about crisis in it. But I think there must be a move towards against violence, against war, against using might as a way of settling it. I don't think we can support Russia for their incursion, to use the word of Pak Marzuki, into Ukraine for any, but we must also understand a solution can only be found if we understand both sides, the issues on both sides, and then we can become a very, very honest broker to settle in the peace. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make this intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Shed Hamid Albar. I think um, more and more we start to identify all the points that we uh, speak up to, that we, we can raise and voice to the ASEAN uh, leaders. Um, you mentioned about um, the additional points, which is, um, in terms of Ukraine, we can actually discuss whether Ukraine can be a bridge to bring both sides together. Uh, quoting Kissinger, yeah, you mentioned uh, that something like this, something as a breakthrough as this, could have been spoken by ASEAN, right? To mm. to 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 find solution. And I was intrigued by uh, you when you saying 
uh, in order to find solution, you need to be a practitioner. <laughs> you need to be able to sense whether something is a real threat or just a bluff, yeah? And so you can choose the right, uh, the right thing. But your closing was also uh, interesting. You say that peace in the world is in our region. So we should be more confident that we too can be uh, the example uh, of uh, peace initiatives, not European people. So thank you for that. And of course, we still have one more. Um, one of uh, our colleagues from Thailand, Kun Kopsak Chutikol. I place you uh, at the last uh, row of uh, putting something on the table because you're very good at uh, tying the knots and, <laughs> and also uh, you're very keen in identifying uh, some of the uh, uh, missing points in what we, uh, we have discussed. Uh, so Kun uh, Kopsak is a former member of parliament in Thailand, a former Thailand ambassador uh, also. So we're very happy to have you. Please uh, raise your thoughts uh, here. Please open the microphone. Right. Thank you, Dina, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome again, Dr. Sasa. Uh, listening and watching him speak, I was reminded of uh, President Zelensky. Uh, you are the Zelensky of Myanmar. And I would encourage you to continue your outreach, uh, uh, not your media, because a lot of what's happening now uh, and a lot of the world interest and the support that Ukraine has uh, been receiving is because maybe because personalities do matter. Individuals do matter. And how President Zelensky has presented the case of his people is very impressive. And that is perhaps why the whole world has risen in support. One, one of the factors, one of the factors, we can look at sort of geopolitical and all, all the other uh, considerations. But as, uh, as uh, Tansi uh, Hamid Abba has said, the humanity of it, just one person standing there in the midst of falling bombs and air attacks and artillery and saying, I will not leave. I will fight for my people, willing to die there in the streets for his independence of his country, of his nation. I think that touches humanity everywhere. So I, I think, as we say, it's a bit uh, distant from ASEAN, from our region, but certainly we follow it with interest because of the common humanity, certainly. Secondly, because I think also because it touches certain basic principles, as all of you have said, principles of sovereignty, principles of territorial integrity, which has held ASEAN together, which has created overall peace in this region of ours in South Southeast Asia. And those are the principles that have to be constantly reaffirmed and spoken about, because this is what we have the right fully to do as smaller countries, medium-sized countries, far away countries that do not have a direct role uh, in the Ukraine crisis, in the war there. But we do have an interest in seeing international principles, the international order, United Nations Charter being reaffirmed uh, and being placed as the sine qua non. You cannot uh, sort of uh, say, okay, let's have might, I have might, I have this, as to, to, to say, look, instead of that, let's use this. Although, as uh, uh, Hamid has said, of course, in practice, we do know that a lot of the times might is right, uh, and there is no moral equivalence for certain incidents, certain crises that have occurred around the world. Nobody is totally right, nobody is totally wrong. But when there is a case of a violation of those third principles, basic principles that has held us in Southeast Asia, has held ASEAN together, I think ASEAN has to be in the forefront to say, no, this is not right. 
although we are friendly to everybody, but this, these basic principles are not right. That's, that's one, I think. And then we have to look at our own region. Okay, so we have those principles and let's reaffirm soft plan, zone of peace, neutrality, no nuclear weapons in Southeast Asia. Let's reaffirm that, make that clear again. Secondly, we have the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Then we have our own ASEAN Charter, lays out the principles of interstate uh, cooperation and of how good governance, of how people should be administered and how they live inside their own nations. Those are the things that we have also now to stress uh, in the midst of this crisis. Uh, and certainly we have to let, maybe look at a medium term or longer term. Immediate near term in the face of superpower, conflict, rivalry of might of arms, perhaps yes, ASEAN cannot do much and it's so far away from us. But let's look at the medium term, maybe ASEAN can say that we can do some humanitarian reconstruction when the time comes. Uh, we can help in national reconstruction, nation building when the time comes, because we have those, we, we, we have those, uh, we, we have those uh, 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 capabilities and then we have done it in our region, even in Cambodia and Timor-Leste uh, and those uh, areas. So I, I think we have to get together and try to look at the immediate term emphasis on principles, in um, medium term, longer term, what ASEAN as a whole, what positive role we can play. At the same time, I, I would like to uh, you know, uh, align myself with uh, the remarks of Dr. Sasa. There must be established a moral equivalence between the situation in Ukraine and the situation in Myanmar. Myanmar also is under military occupation. The people of Myanmar have also been attacked through military means, through arms, through might. And might there once also be considered as right. Long history, longer than even uh, in uh, Central Europe, thousands of years going back, colonialism and all, all of that is being put uh, uh, and, and alluded to. We can forget all that, but what is at present, what is the situation? I think this moral equivalence between the two situations uh, is something relevant for ASEAN and justifiable for ASEAN. We can ask, do white lives matter more? Why the great flow of aid assistance, one billion, two billion, just like that, going into Ukraine immediately, where thousands of lives have been lost, continued fighting, bombing from the air also, doesn't elicit the same kind of concern and coverage in international media. Maybe this is because we, we, we also have the duty within our own region to bring that case to the international community, to the United Nations, to have a resolution, emergency session. We can do all that together, the 10 nations of ASEAN. Uh, if we are united and cohesive. But first of all, we have to recognize that we are not. That ASEAN, the, the divisions within ASEAN getting maybe larger, uh, the fractures, uh, cleavages are becoming more apparent, uh, not only now, but also on Myanmar, on other things, on the great power, uh, uh, confrontation, US, China. So we have to realize, although, for example, this Ukraine crisis has created enormous unity among European countries, EU, NATO, the Western Alliance, this has revived the Western Alliance, the NATO, EU. But for ASEAN, the Myanmar crisis, the situation in Myanmar has led to differences within ASEAN, differences that perhaps more and more uh, uh, there's a danger of ASEAN breaking up into two camps even, a, a peninsular land ASEAN and an archipelago ASEAN uh, with different emphasis. Even on the Ukraine crisis, we see that 
although eventually, eventually eight countries voted for uh, the resolution, uh, two, of course, certainly as expected, uh, abstain, Vietnam and Laos. Uh, but individual countries, their statements uh, went in almost to extremes. Singapore certainly very bravely immediately came out on the basis of principles. It condemned Russia. Asian statements did not even mention Russia. There was no condemnation, no uh, call for withdrawal of forces. Uh, that's the minimum bottom line of ASEAN, uh, you know, the, the least common denominator kind of resolution as usual. And of course, again, as we heard, uh, the, uh, Matsuki has made that important point that you know, even in Myanmar, I uh, mean, online said he's going to send uh, troops to support uh, the Russians. So, I mean, two extremes within the ASEAN. So it's very hard to bring everything together. But we must try. We must try. Because we have to see that it's not just a country of uh, Ukraine, Russia, or the West and the East, NATO, the former Warsaw Pact or whatever, uh, that is at, at stake. It's a principle. It's a question of principles, basic principles, sovereignty, territory, integrity, UN Charter are at stake. On the, the question of principles, you know, just to uh, maybe just a caveat uh, because of the uh, point that Etta raised about self-determination. We have to be very cautious here. Right of self-determination, yes perhaps of people within boundaries, within borders, or in times of, during the colonial times, it's also a right, yes. But now, should we elevate it to the same level as sovereignty and territorial integrity? Because this is what Russia is doing. They're saying the Donbass area, the people in those areas have a right to self-determination. People in Crimea have a right the self-determination, and they go in to reinforce that those rights. Imagine in our own region, if that, you know, because we have a diversity of peoples, of regions, sub-regions, towns, countries, tribes, if everybody say, okay, on the basis of that, we also want to be independent. We also want uh, people to come in uh, with an army uh, to enforce and to give us uh, sovereign in independence. That would be very quite messy for this region. So I think we have to stand on the key basic principles of sovereignty and territory integrity as indicated in the UN Charter. And of course, we do also don't have, uh, we have perhaps the luxury of, of distance from the crisis but perhaps we don't have the luxury of time as much. People will now expect us to also come up with a cohesive position of ASEAN. Certainly when we go, ASEAN leaders go and eventually they accept the invitation of President Biden to go to Washington. People will be looking, does ASEAN have a united stand on this? We thought that, you know, this in, in could have been an invitation, could have been a session, welcomed session between ASEAN and the US, maybe summit, could have been on uh, free trade, could have been on Indo-Pacific strategy, or even on uh, uh, the US-China confrontation. But I would think that it, this is all going to be overtaken by the Ukraine crisis. When and if our leaders together go to Washington, and the local press there certainly would pick on every member to say, what is your stand? Because it's a strong sentiment there locally in Washington, in New York, on the Ukraine crisis. And we would be in danger of exposing ourselves that there are cracks within ASEAN, that we are not united, that we not, do not stand together. And they would say, look, oh, oh, see, on the Ukraine crisis, you also have these caveats. You also have this on the one hand, on the other hand, standing in the middle, like you do on the Myanmar crisis, you know. Yeah. And you also have uh, in psychology, my, my daughter teaches psychology. So, so she tells me these stories about this psychologist in the past. His name was Buridan. 
he has a theory. He had a theory that if you put a donkey right in the middle between two bales of hay, you know what would happen? The donkey would die of starvation because turning left, turning right, he cannot decide which bale of hay <laughs> to eat, to, that is his food. So he would rather, perhaps by default die of starvation because he cannot make a choice. Yeah, yeah. For us, if we say we have to be neutral, we can't choose. Uh, we, there's no right or wrong. That is the danger perhaps for ASEAN. So I would say but this crisis perhaps has come maybe as an opportune time in the immediate uh, time frame it has sort of overshadowed the concerns of Myanmar. But if we play it right to say, look, these the two things are the same. Transgression of international norms of UN Charter and the international community acting. If you act in Ukraine, you have to act in Myanmar too. ASEAN also, all the neighbors of Ukraine are acting. As the Tansi said, are the ASEAN neighbors of Myanmar opening their doors to the refugees from Myanmar or turning them back? Is there humanity in ASEAN or not? Are we still preaching, as Tansi says, only about humanity, but not practicing it? So this is a very important time for ASEAN, I think. We have to look at ourselves. We have to coordinate better. We have to talk among each other. And it's not for next year, it's not for the UN in September or whatever, but right away in about two or three weeks time, we have to go to Washington as a united ASEAN alliance and make stand positions known on an important international world global issue. Where does ASEAN stand? We can say, oh, on the one hand, Singapore is like that. On the other hand, Vietnam is like that, you know, and Thailand is like the breeding donkey right, right in the middle, <laughs> trying to choose which bale of hay to eat. No, no, no. So time is not with us, two or three weeks. And we have to remember the UNGA session. It's not, it's, it hasn't been closed. It's an open-ended, ongoing. It can be reconvened anytime, the emergency session. Uh -huh. So I, I think all those things are of particular interest for us. And it's good that Indonesia, the largest country of ASEAN, you know, through dinner, through Pat Rosman, and through you know, the ambassador, is showing interest in this. You have to governize ASEAN. As yeah. far, I mean, I would say ASEAN is not we it's not small, six, seven hundred million people. We can make a stand, but we have to get our house in order first. Yeah. Uh, and I think what can catalyze our thinking okay. is the fight of our own neighbor of Myanmar. What stand we make there, what principles we push forward, what calls we make on the international community to come and help. Okay. Facetiously, uh, Dancy Ahmed, if you forgive me, I, I would make a, a, a fallacious uh, 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 suggestion to Dr. Sasa, why don't you come out, Dr. Sasa said, we also want to join NATO. <laughs> Western international community, except Myanmar into NATO. Will they do that? Because you are also under threat of Russian arms, of Russian helicopters and Russian jets. <laughs> Throw this back. Thank you. Gina. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gunkov Sak. Oh, you're leaving it with uh, more puzzles. But um, okay, brothers, sisters, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies attending, participating, also you participating through uh, live YouTube. Uh, we get the scope of the perspectives in ASEAN. As, uh, as you can see, um, they answer my questions beyond what is asked, actually. They already highlighted some of the important uh, events upcoming in a very short uh, days from now. 
uh, what Kun Kopsak mentioned was the 20, uh, well, presumably 20th of March, yeah, meeting between ASEAN EU, uh, sorry, ASEAN US, uh, where President Biden is uh, expected to bring all ASEAN leaders to Washington. So also there's the UNGA um, possible reconvening. And then, of course, the ASEAN has its own big uh, gathering, yeah, usually in April. I don't know if the schedule uh, remains intact, but usually the summit should be held very soon. So I think what... the G20 what... in Indonesia. Dina. Yes, the G20 in Indonesia. <laughs> Putin, is he coming? Are we inviting him, for example? Right, you see, right. You know, uh, and the APEC summit also in Bangkok, we have a, this big issue now. That's Are true. Are we expected to invite Putin or should we or not? Will Biden come or not come? So those yeah. are questions that relate to our region directly, and we have a right uh, to take a position on it. Thank you. So I'm inviting the uh, other participants uh, to join us. Uh, you, what, what do you think have been missing from the dialogue? What do you wish uh, for ASEAN leaders to hear? Please uh, Raise your voice, <laughs> open the microphone, let me know. You can raise your hand uh, to identify yourself. Yes, uh, Ambassador Hamza Tayyip. Uh, good evening, everybody. It would be good nice. evening. Well, um, thank you very much uh, for having me. And I, I, I have listened very carefully to everybody's uh, statements or remarks. And by Hamid, I really uh, also followed the year. Uh, statements by Kissinger, by Professor Meshmer, and all those historical backgrounds. And that is why I think we, history is a very good teacher for all of us. And we must also be honest with this history because like you said, uh, uh, NATO, America, and the Western uh, uh, allies have been always trying to push NATO towards the East. And in the very beginning, Putin, even Gorbachev said, no, you must not <laughs> move NATO to, towards the east because that will be right at the border of, the, of, the, of Russia. But this is, this is what happened. And therefore, uh, eight years, uh, Putin was already a bit uh, jittery with this development. And that's why he said, enough is enough. That's why this happened. This is what we are facing now. My worry is uh, the impact towards China and towards Indo-Pacific. Because if, it, if, if China sees, oh, okay, this is the way to do it. Uh, we just use force. We will be impacted, the whole of ASEAN, we will be impacted. And this, this is exactly what uh, everybody has been saying. We need to be cohesive. We have to be united uh, with our stance. And I don't know how to do this, but can we bring all these parties to, uh, to the table? We have the East Asia Summit. Nobody mentioned about the East Asia Summit as one of the mechanism of ASEAN. Uh, why, why would not we try that and try to resolve the Indo-Pacific issues that we are facing, the rise of China, uh, and try to find a solution? So th there are two sol issues that we must really deal with. One is for us ourselves to get united, cohesive, uh, and then with that, we can try to resolve the Russia and Ukraine if we are invited to, to, to Washington. And at the same time, look through the East Asia Summit for our Indo-Pacific area, uh, try to, to, to resolve these issues. Uh, this, this is of course for politicians, and uh, but I think this is one of the uh, ways that we can do as ASEAN, uh, like uh, you mentioned, ASEAN is not small, it's big, but we need to resolve and try to show the world that, that we still exist. That would be all, Abudina. Hey, thank you so very much for my... <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, okay, because this is informal anyway, uh, before we continue the discussion, I would like to invite everybody to open the camera. We can uh, take pictures together. Uh, while we are thinking, uh, what else can we uh, highlight? Yeah, uh, I think I'm asking this serious question. If there there is one sentence, two sentence that 
you wish to be uh, mentioned by ASEAN leaders in their upcoming statements, in their upcoming joint statements, what would it be? You know, something that uh, you wish uh, can be said. Uh, Nadila, can you take the lead? Do you wish to open uh, your camera? The rest of the participants uh, not yet opening the camera. Okay. Maybe that's all. So we can just take the picture, Nadila. Okay. Uh, let me. Maybe we can wait for one minute, Budina. Maybe some of uh, the participant will be like getting ready to open their camera for one minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's wait. wait a few few seconds more. Okay, okay, just take the picture and then we can continue. Okay. Okay, yes, uh, I will click the button of the screenshot in... Oh, yeah, Pak Makarim udah kelempar kali ya. Okay, uh, I will press the button in three, two, one. Once more, uh, I will press the button in three, two, one. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, let's, uh, we still have a few more minutes, uh, about 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, who else want to put... Uh, Put, uh, put more on the table or respond to what has been uh, placed uh, in front of you. Uh, maybe any of the speakers also, ah, Kun Kopsa, you wanna add? Yes. Uh, open your mic. Oh, Alba wants to speak also. Oh, sure, Pak Marzuki. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Well, well, Maybe just salad and coffee uh, yeah. when we end up our family dinner. Uh, yes. uh, I think Ambassador Hamza raised something that we have not really touched so much on. Yeah. And China. I think the role of China in this, you know, whether they will be the mediator, whether they will support Russia, they will, whether they buy the natural gas from Russia, or whether would, they would draw back a little bit and try to, to mediate uh, and try to offer their services even to the Western uh, countries uh, and to say that, look, uh, even to the Americans, to say, let's make a bargain. I'll help you. I'll do something to get us, us out of all this crisis, energy crisis, uh, economic crisis, uh, but you lessen uh, your confrontation against us. If that happens, for example, that would be a, a kind of game changer for us in this region. No, we, we have been going through 10, 20 years of how to deal with uh, uh, American uh, Chinese confrontation. You have to make a choice or not, and all of that. And of course, uh, it, it involves you know, Taiwan uh, and, and all of that, and how they deal with ASEAN. Uh, but in any case, I, I think that's something of interest to follow. Not only you know day to day battlefield on uh, in Kiev in other cities in Ukraine and all that, but what the Chinese are saying and doing may be of more consequence uh, uh, for us in this region. Also, not only for ASEAN but in particular also for Myanmar, how they weigh up their interests, how they weigh what their policies will be to Myanmar in the oh. face of this very clear. Uh, you know, uh, Russian assertiveness, let's say, at the very least, uh, and the, even the presence of Russian arms uh, uh, and military presence uh, in Myanmar. So, okay. uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, at Mem Etta first, and then Pak Marzuki, and then Pak Hamid. Uh, <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you, Dina. I, this, was, this was the point that I raised a while ago when I gave our statement, as a matter of fact, we feel that if Russia is allowed to invade Ukraine and succeeds in that, that will embolden China to do likewise. And uh, in this regard, it does not just involve us bilaterally, but it involves several ASEAN countries. 
as, that's why, as I was saying, don't you think, you know, the point that was raised by um, Malaysian Ambassador um, Abad, uh, Dr. Syed Am Albar, when he said that uh, Asia could, ASEAN could be some kind of a buffer state that, that could bridge differences between the West and Russia because we're a big nation, that's fine, but uh, ASEAN has to internally give more mechanisms in order to be able to <clears throat> address its own problems. We, we, the, what kind of mechanism? The reason that ASEAN does not, is not at war, the countries are not at war with each other is because they don't, the, the, there are no mechanisms to try to resolve real problems existing among the peoples, you know? So there's, there's, um, there, there's no effort. There are no mechanisms like human rights. How do you resolve human rights? The rule of law, non-interference. Non-interference is a basic policy. And, the, and what else is that? And then if there is no consensus, then there is no solution to whatever problems there is. So unless and until such time that ASEAN is able to resolve that, a majority rule, for instance, the rule of law, respect for human rights, then it's very difficult for ASEAN to develop further than what it is right now. There is no war, there's no conflict because ASEAN itself does not try to resolve its own problems with respect to human rights and the rule of law. That's the way I see it. And that's the reason why it doesn't bother much with Myanmar, which is very frustrating, really very frustrating. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ma'am Eta. Pa Marzuki? Uh, Prohina, may I just concede to Pa Alba, please? Uh... Ah, okay. Pa Alba. Please open the, the microphone. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pak Mazuki, for conceding to me. I just would like to see, you know, a very, very short one. I think we are now looking at the, the party that, that brings the conflict or take the active action that causes the present conflict. I think there is also a we. There must be preventive diplomacy in whatever we do. You know, you must take care of the Asian perpetrator. Who provokes the situation? You know, like uh, what Macron said is quite true. When he says that we are our, the policy of Europe, NATO, insofar as Putin is concerned or Russia, is not right because we are driving Russia out. You remember in 2008, Russia wanted to be a member of the NATO. And it was totally rejected because they thought with the end of the Cold War, 1991, it's natural for them to be part of the family of Europe. And we are pushing. And now, I think I'm a bit concerned. They are in Asia, they have been a uh, history of forced <laughs> occupation. You know, you say, for example, India wanted... Goa was part of India, I think, historically. And when the colonial master refused, it went in and took Goa and make it part. And there are other examples that we can give, you know. So there is this sort of thing. And now, if you can see uh, China, India, and uh, I think, uh, I don't, don't think that their economy is going to be impacted because I, do, I personally feel that they are not acting unplanned. I think it is a very planned, strategic move in every part that they have, they have taken. It doesn't happen by... Then now China is warning UK not to provoke, not to uh, provoke a situation of, you know, they want to have good... And they are also warning US and also talking about Hong Kong. So, I mean, we cannot 
be looking at all these issues as purely conceptual or theoretical. It's a real issue to us. So we must be proactive in coming up with solution. Now, just to correct Loretta, I didn't say that ASEAN should play the, the bridge role. I was talking about Ukraine right. in that part of the world itself mm. is the best because they are the basketball for everything. They are very rich in every, every... So I think ASEAN must wake up that, you know, it must not have this inferiority complex that we are, you know, let us forget about, you know, our borders before. And I, I always objected to international law because I teach international law. I objected to international law when borders are determined by our colonial masters. It should be our, our way of looking at our border. But now it, it, and we have problem. I think in Africa, there is so much problem, you know. So I think uh, it is important to take notice of all the highlights that the, pre, the speakers have said, Indo-Pacific, you know, Ambassador uh, Hamza said just now, in, in, uh, in the uh, Chinese rule. So all these things, we must come and don't abandon diplomacy. We must go back to diplomacy if we want to have a peaceful and secure world. Thank you. Sorry Thank you. for taking time. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, uh, Dr. Albar. Um, maybe Pamazuki, you at the closing, yeah? Let me invite Dr. Sasa first. All Dr. Right. Sasa? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, finally, just I'd like to say thank you to all of you. Really, um, your uh, uh, the lecture, your knowledge has been just such a valuable to me, and I have written a lot <laughs> in my notes of all you're saying because it's very important. And then I just like to make two points. First point is, <clears throat> I totally agree with all of you that the ASEAN is a very, very important in the world. Why? Because China, you know, as you say, is the biggest population in the world and India. If you only call by China, India, and ASEAN is 600 million, 700 million people, half populations of the world are in our hands. We have to take care of it. There's no other choice. Security, economic. So ASEAN, if we really play strategically, visionarily, we can control half of the world peace and security. That is in our hand, actually. That is in our hand. As uh, Dr. Said, uh, Minister said, uh, that we, you know, we have to be uh, proactive. I totally agree with you. Why are we sleeping so much? We have to wake up. We have to do the things. Because if uh, in action of ASEAN will mean in actions of half of the world in this planet. That's very simple. And secondly, and the last point is that I think diplomacy is very, very important. And we need to give the chance to diplomacy. No political solution can be done on the battlefield. The world history proves again and again political solutions, diplomatic solutions. We have to give the chance to political and diplomatic as much as possible. And I really believe so, that we can really make a difference by making humanity clear and loud. Of course, dear friends, we cannot undo the past. The past is just for our teacher. But we cannot do undo our, what our grandfather have done. They have done it. They have died, passed away. We can only cry. We can only cry. We cannot undo it. But the future belongs to our hands today. Tomorrow belongs to today. That means that if we cannot act today, our future will be dark tomorrow. It's a very, very simple. And ASEAN have to act. 
because tomorrow belongs to us. The future belongs to us. The past is past. We cannot undo. But tomorrow, we have a chance today. Do it together. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sasa, for the hopeful message. Uh, Amazuki. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please I bring us just, together. I was just listening uh, very carefully to the colleagues, uh, panelists. Uh, I uh, cannot agree more. Uh, and uh, certainly take take note of the impassioned uh, reassertion of principles uh, and values that ASEAN stands for. Uh, sovereignty, national integrity. The point that perhaps needs to be brought out much more visibly uh, is that before we take on the world, I think we have to fix our a bit of uh, the uh, house matters uh, in ASEAN. Uh, to go out from the ASEAN statement, a two point ASEAN statement, I would put it very simply and bluntly that this is not the kind of statement that we would expect from our finding, founding fathers of ASEAN. It, it's that far that we, that we have been downsliding over these past 50 years. It, it borders on the irresponsibility. ASEAN is not playing a role commensurate to its importance in global affairs. Now, why is that? Because ASEAN has been in a process of uh, being busy with themselves. We have become introverted because of national development issues. And therefore, uh, our sensitivity and responsiveness to international affairs have been blunted. Now, these are the kinds of issues that I can't imagine being bandied around in a formal ASEAN setting. As Paaba was saying, we have a different way of doing things. But why are we so uh, wide away from the international uh, perspective on international issues such as Ukraine? Then, and therefore, uh, the question arises that ASEAN values are such so uh, different than what the mainstream international community believes in. And if that is the case, what ASEAN rules-based organization is being aspired to. So my worry is that if we don't get our act together in ASEAN, the, even the Myanmar issue is going to be protracted, is going to be uh, suspended in its solution, and fatigue will set in, and an ill-conceived solution be imposed on Myanmar. And I will say this, uh, that a number of ASEAN countries have become very restricted political systems. And if this goes on, the downslide will go down further. Now, uh, 
it may be that this is a wake-up call for ASEAN, in fact. When the statement was issued, I understand that there was an analysis on the Russian reaction to the Western pressure on uh, Russia and on the Ukraine crisis, and that the Russian outpost in Vladivostok was informed to be on alert, security alert. Now, what does that say to us? It may be that perhaps it is time for ASEAN to look into a possible closer defense arrangement within ASEAN. Something that may not be easily accepted, but the realities are such that only if we have some sort of a collective security outlook, we will be much more sensitive towards issues such as the encroachment of external powers such as China. Now, to that end, I think we need an internal dialogue that allows for analytical content to emerge, strategic thinking, thought processes to be allowed within ASEAN. Where do we, uh, where is it possible uh, to do that? That is something I think we will have to think about and perhaps could be a topic of a further discussions. But uh, go back to what uh, Ambassador Kopsak mentioned on the ASEAN, US ASEAN, ASEAN summit. I think we should have a few points uh, to be brought out. And that is that, uh, first of all, the United States will have to reassert ASEAN's role in settling issues within this region itself. And secondly, I think it is time for the United States to clarify its policy rather than just uh, issuing statements of concerns about what is happening in Myanmar. It should also be perhaps brought out, brought out that uh, the United States and ASEAN should try to re-engage UN agencies operating in Myanmar. There has been a visible slack of UN engagement, uh, and this spotlights the, the state of the UN at the moment. Furthermore, it should be made clear to the United States that sanctions on individuals should be strengthened to the extent of tracing their assets. This is the only way to put pressure on the junta. And finally, my concern is that if we don't address the situation in Myanmar, a solution will be imposed and we will be saddled with a, another ASEAN country with a very restricted political system. And that bodes really ill for the future of ASEAN. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pa Marzuki. My brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Um, I think um, it has been very, uh, rich discussion. I hope you uh, agree that by uh, discussing like this, by putting everything on the table, uh, we can actually see that um, there are many things uh, that ASEAN should that that should move ASEAN to come together and uh, really uh, take a more central role, take a more active role 
in the uh, current development, not only for the sake of um, humanitarian issues or the issue of territorial integrity or the things that uh, normatively has been uh, mentioned in various forms, but um, the speakers tonight have uh, spoken up about the deeper implications, deeper, deeper unintended consequences that this region, uh, Southeast Asia, would bear if we don't do something beyond the two statement that has been uh, issued a few, uh, few days ago, the 26th of um, February, by the, uh, by the leaders in ASEAN, by the ASEAN foreign ministers. Uh, we have opportunities upcoming. So uh, we really hope that uh, by presenting all these views from different uh, member states, we scope the perspectives of ASEAN. Um, we invited as well uh, some of the uh, figures from other member states, uh, and we raise their position as well during the discussion. Hopefully, that way we are not left leaving behind the, the potential differences of opinions uh, among us. Uh, but we all agree that ASEAN should stand together strong, that ASEAN should be confident that we have uh, opportunity, we have rooms to maneuver, even if um, it seems like uh, at a very short moment, the rooms to maneuver is not as safe for our region, but the reality is uh, we still have to do uh, something. So thank you very much once again to all the speakers uh, who agree to share the thoughts and uh, it makes us uh, informed and uh, more knowledgeable about the issue. And I also would like to thank all the very attentive participants, uh, not only here, I uh, know that also there are uh, viewers uh, in YouTube who has been very loyal <laughs> since the start. Hopefully, uh, we, uh, we trigger uh, greater dialogues among ASEAN. Hopefully, uh, we contribute something to our community. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. See you soon. Stay safe. <laughs> Probably should reinvigorate regional resilience approach. Yay! <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, you. Dr. Sasa. Thank you. Good Pam Marzuki. Kun Kopsa, thank you so much. I cannot do this without you. Yeah. Thank Dr. Night, Dr. Albert, everybody. thank you so much. Yes. Pa Alan, Dr. Sasa, thank you. take care. Thank yes. You. Yeah, thank Good you. Luck. Thank you. Oh, bye, Dr. Sasa. See you soon. You have a new name, Dr. Sasa. You are the uh, Zelensky. <laughs> yes. I'm not so sure Sun. whether that is good or not. <laughs> His name is Sasa Zelensky. <laughs> Sasa Zelensky. <laughs>